Well, God bless you. Welcome. Uh, last day of June. I mean, last Sunday in June, not last day of June. Last Sunday in June. We still got two more days of June. Then we hit July. So summer's here. We're in the midst of summer. Um, you can take your Bibles and go to Matthew chapter 5. Um, here in Matthew chapter 5 is uh, what is commonly referred to as uh, the Sermon on the Mount, and it starts with what is known as the Beatitudes, or um, some people call it blessed attitudes. Um, and what we have here are principles uh, that Jesus taught on how to live. These were true at the time he spoke it. And these are still true today. Even in times like these that we find ourselves in 2020. The words of Jesus Christ cut through time. They cut through culture. And they're true. Because Jesus spoke them. These blessed attitudes are really what they are. They, they show us the lifestyle of a believer. This is the way we as um, disciples of Jesus Christ should conduct our lives. And so I'd just like to start and read these with you here in Matthew chapter 5. And we'll start in verse 1. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Poor in spirit uh, uh, is a, very similar to what Sean taught last week, that we are to have humility. It's the first thing that Jesus said, was to be poor in spirit, not, uh, not a you know, not a prideful spirit, but we're to be humble. Verse 4, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You know, years before I really studied the Sermon on the Mount, I, I always, I, I thought Jesus was saying, oh, those people over there. I always like pictured the people at a, like at a bus station. Those poor people and those, uh, those meek people, uh, they need a blessing, you know, right? <laughs> we should bless. And then I realized, he's talking to me, right? This is the way I'm supposed to be. And it really changed my whole perspective reading the words of Jesus when I said, he's speaking to me and to my heart. Verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Verse 10, blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you falsely and say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice! And be glad, for your reward in heaven is great, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Verse 13, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Verse 14, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand and gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. As we live these lifestyles, as we live these ways that Jesus spoke, we're the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. And our light is shown by living this way. Our light and our lifestyle is manifest to the world. The one that I'd like to focus on today here is being a peacemaker. 
to be peacemakers in times like these. A peacemaker is exactly what that says. It's someone who makes peace. Um, someone who helps ease hostilities between two parties, whether it's you and another person, whether it's between two people, whether it's between multitudes and different factions. A peacemaker is one who helps to ease the hostilities and makes peace. In this world that we live in today, I ask myself the question, where are the peacemakers? Where are those who make peace? It is a time for us as Jesus' disciples, as his called out, as those who are the light of the world, it's time for us to be peacemakers in this world that has so much hate, so much division, so much confusion, so many hurtful words, so many ungodly attitudes and actions, disorder, pandemonium. I ask the question, where are the peacemakers? Where are those who will rise up and make peace and bring peace? Look at Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews 12. Hebrews chapter 12, and in verse 14. Hebrews 12, verse 14. It says, pursue peace. Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. We are to pursue peace. That should be our pursuit. That should be our aim. We're not to pursue strife or division. We're not to pursue envy or anger. We're not to, uh, to pursue pride. We're not to pursue jealousy. We're not to pursue factions. We're not to... Dis uh, pursue disputes. We're not to pursue dissensions. We're not to pursue carousing. I just named all the works of the flesh listed in Galatians chapter 5, 19 through 21. Those are the things of the flesh that the world pursues. We as disciples of Jesus Christ are to pursue peace. We're to pursue it. We're to go after it to make peace and be peacemakers. Look at Romans. I love this. This verse in Romans is just awesome. Romans. Romans chapter 12. <clears throat> Romans chapter 12 and verse 18. If possible, if possible, so as far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. You know, I, I for those of you that uh, follow Facebook or, you know, in the social media world, I'm amazed. I mean, it's, it's just not possible. For me to have peace with this person. It's not possible. <laughs> Look what it says. If possible, and then it gives you what makes it possible. So far as depends on you, be at peace with all men. You see, if a person doesn't want to be at peace with me, I can't control people, right? 
I can't control others. I got enough difficulty controlling this, you know what I mean? I got a problem here. So this is where I pursue peace, within this individual right here. And as much as possible, I try to be at peace with all men. Doesn't matter their religion, it doesn't matter their race, it doesn't matter their political agenda, it doesn't matter if they're a right or if they're a left. I pursue peace. Peace. We are to be the peacemakers. Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6 discusses the spiritual battle that we are in, right? What's really going on behind the scenes and the spiritual influences that that affect the world that we live in. And in Ephesians 6, 12, it talks about this battle. Ephesians 6, 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. A lot of times it looks like that, but that's not our struggle. It's against rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you will be able to resist the evil day in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. And then it gives you the armaments, the different things that the spiritual armament of a disciple of Christ, the spiritual armament of a believer. And the one I want to point out is in verse 15, what you cover your feet with, right? What what do we put on for our feet And it says, verse 15, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of what? Peace. That my feet are shod with the gospel of peace. I think that's pretty cool that that that's what my feet, that's what I'm to pursue, that's where I'm going. I'm pursuing peace. My feet are shod with the gospel of peace. It reminds me of what it says in Romans 10, 15 and Isaiah 52, 7. How blessed or how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the gospel of peace or who bring the good tidings. How blessed are the feet because those feet are shod with the gospel of peace, and they bring peace to the world. I love that, that that's what our spiritual armament for our feet is peace. Where we walk, we bring peace. We don't bring contention. We don't bring strife. We don't bring jealousy and factions and division. We bring peace. That is what Jesus told us to do, to be peacemakers, not peace breakers. We should walk in this path and bring peace. Look at Luke 1, Luke 1, Luke 1, 79. Here in Luke, here in Luke is... um, This is a prophecy of the father of John the Baptist. If you remember right, John was born six months before Jesus, and um, uh, Zacharias didn't believe, that. and so then he was deaf, right? And then as soon as he was born, he said his name is John, and his mouth opens up, and he does this incredible prophecy about John the Baptist. And what we're reading here, I'm not quite sure, and I've read it several times, and I think either way is fine, I'm not sure if what we're reading, if he's saying John is going to be making known Jesus and that Jesus is the way of peace, or if he's saying that 
Jesus, who John is foretelling, is going to make a way of peace. I'm not sure which it is. Either way, Jesus is the way of peace, right? However it's taken, I'm not quite sure. But in this prophecy, Jesus is the way of peace. Look at what it says here, verse 79. To shine upon those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. That through Jesus Christ, this is the way of peace. It cuts through all the other stuff. It's the way of Jesus. And Jesus' way, in whatever world, in the world he was in there with the Roman Empire and the division in Judaism, there was a way of peace. Throughout the Middle Ages, there was a way of peace. Throughout the wars of history, there's a way of peace. And today, in 2020, there is a way of peace. And it is the way of Jesus. And as we, as disciples of Jesus Christ, that's what we pursue. The way of peace. To be a peacemaker. Um, Turn to, (laughs) this is pretty wild, turn to Isaiah 59. Here in Isaiah 59 is part of um, part of what's quoted here in Isaiah 59 is what in Romans 3, where, where uh, Paul writes and gives the whole status of humanity, there is none righteous, no, not one. And he lists all these things about the depravity of humanity and where humanity is, right? Part of this is quoted here from Isaiah. And I'd like to pick this up in Isaiah 59 and in verse 4. And, uh, you know, I read these and I I think of the world and and just things come to mind. I don't even have to mention it to you. If you watch any of the news or all of a sudden you say, hey, I've seen that in our day and time. Anyways, Isaiah 59 verse 4, no one sues righteously. And no one pleads honestly. They trust in confusion and speak lies. They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. They hatch adder's eggs and weave spider's webs. He who eats of their eggs dies, and from them which is crushed a snake breaks forth. Their webs will not become clothing, nor will they cover themselves with their works. Their works are works of iniquity. An acts of violence is in their hands. Their feet run to evil. They hasten to shed innocent blood. They kill people unjustly. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Devastation and destruction are in their highways. The path that the world follows is a path of devastation and destruction. They do not know the way of peace. They don't know what you and I know. They don't know. They don't know what peace really is. There is no justice in their tracks, in the tracks that they make. They have made their paths crooked. And whoever treads on them does not know peace. You follow down those paths, and you know no peace. Peace comes with the Prince of Peace. But Jesus Christ, let the world see a path of peace in you. Let them see peace, not hostility, not division, not anger. Let them see peace. Let them see the way of peace. So, How do you be a peacemaker? And then I'd like to take the rest of this time to go through some of these just practical things 
that I see in the scripture of how you and I can be peacemakers in this world and not peace breakers, but peacemakers. Isaiah 26, 3 from the King James Version says, um, uh, whose mind is stayed on thee. Uh, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusts in thee. I think NASB says steadfast, those who are steadfast in mind. Our mind, the first thing is keep your mind on God. Those who steadfast on him, whose mind is stayed on Yahweh, right? Whose mind is stayed on God. He will keep in perfect peace. The only way I know to keep my mind stayed on God is keep in prayer, diligent prayer, to keep my head here in the book, to fellowship with people who help me think about God. That's how I keep my mind on God. I, I, I can't even watch the news. I try to, and I can't, I can't even watch it anymore. From either side, left, right, the bias, I can't do it because it doesn't take my mind to God. It takes my mind, whatever side of the spectrum you're on, it takes my mind into dissension and strife and division. This is how I stay my mind on God. And when I do, it keeps me in perfect peace. So that's the first thing. Keep your mind on God. Look at James in the New Testament. James chapter 1. James 1. James 1, verse 19. And this is my next thing. Be quick to hear. In other words, and slow to speak. In other words, listen. Listen to other points of view. Listen. Have an ear that's willing to listen. James 1.19 says, This you know, beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear and slow to speak and slow to anger. Look at Proverbs 18. Proverbs 18. We're going to do a lot of Proverbs. Proverbs has so much good, just good common horse sense, right? Good sense of how to live. Proverbs 18, verse 13. It says, He who gives an answer before he hears, it is folly and shame to him. And yet this happens all the time. People won't even listen to each other. They've already made up their mind what you think, and they just... Listen, shut up, and listen to someone else. You know, we have two ears, one mouth, double, double listen. Be quick to hear. Look at Proverbs 17. Next thing, don't offend. That's a big one. Don't purposely try to offend someone else. And if you do, because I'm pretty sure all of us have experienced this, even though I don't mean to offend, I'm a human, right? I do and say stupid things. It's not that I go out of my way. It's not like I have malice. I'm just a stupid human, right? So if in my stupidity I happen to offend, reconcile quickly. 
Just reconcile that. Walk in the spirit of gentleness and forgiveness. Look at Proverbs 17, verse 14. The beginning of strife is like letting out water. So abandon the quarrel before it breaks out, right? It's like turning on the faucet or getting the hose out. You want to be the crimp in the hose, right? We don't want to be the water letting out. We want to be the one that stops the water. You don't want to be the one that stirs up strife. Look at uh, Proverbs 18, verse 19. A brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city. And contentions are like the bars of a citadel. You know, if, if I'm teaching here, and maybe I don't even aware of it, and I say something that offends someone, they can't hear the rest of my teaching. They just can't. You know, you're speaking with someone and you say something offensive, they can't hear you. They're not going to hear you anymore. It's what it says. They're, they're like a castle. And, and they're not going to hear anything else. So we as disciples of Jesus Christ especially want to tailor, want to monitor ourselves that we do not offend. That we don't go out of our way to be offensive because it's like, it's like the bards of, it's like starting to storm a castle once that happens. So don't be offensive. Um, look at Matthew 5. We'll be back and look at some Proverbs, but Matthew chapter 5. Matthew 5, 23, back in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar, and there, is, and there remember you that your brother has something against you. You and your brother have an issue. Here you are, you're trying to worship God. You're bringing, you know, you're come to the altar, right? You're trying to, but you and your brother got an issue. It says, leave your offering before the altar, and first go be reconciled with your brother, and then come and present your offering. Right? Don't let things fester. Go, go to your brother. The other thing, too, about what I'm turning here is, I, I meant to say this, I'm not talking about trying to make peace in the Middle East here, right? I'm not talking about trying to make peace with all the factions that are out there. I'm talking about you in your daily life being at peace in your world. In other words, how about start with your wife, guys, right? <laughs> start at home. And, and then with your neighbors, with people in the church, with people you work with. And if you have Facebook friends, you know, that's a, that's a whole other social network. Within your world and your network, be a peacemaker. Be a peacemaker in your world. And then we'll, you know, from there, maybe we expand out to the, to the rest of the world. But just how about me, right? Me with my world that I live in. Be at peace. Um, look at Matthew 18. Is this the one I want? Yeah, Matthew 18 is the one I want to do. Matthew 18. Oh, this one, this is your brother. This is talking about sin, uh, which is one of the ways that, that there becomes division. Matthew 18, 15. If your brother sins, go and show his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. If your brother makes a mistake and he sinned, go, go tell the world. Go talk to him. Talk to the person. Don't go tell him, oh, you know what, you know what Frank did, Mike? Oh, let me tell you what Frank did. That's not Jesus. That's not the way of Jesus. You got a problem with the brother, you go talk to your brother directly. That's the first thing. That's, we got to live this way. 
That the world does that other. Word. That's not us. We don't go gossiping about everybody else. Luke 17. Luke 17. Again, a lot of these are talking about sin, but they really communicate because, you know, sometimes we think the issue is sin, right? That we have with someone else. Okay, well, it tells us how to deal with that here. And sometimes when you go to talk to the person and you listen, you realize it's not really sin. It's just that we got two different versions of opinions here. Right? But if there is sin, it tells us how to deal with it. Luke 17, I love this, verse 1. He said to his disciples, it is inevitable. In other words, it's going to happen. Right? It's, gonna, it's inevitable that stumbling blocks will come. It's inevitable that people are going to sin. It's inevitable that people are going to offend you and that you're going to offend somebody else just because we are human. It's inevitable these things are going to happen. And then it says it would be, but woe to him through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into a sea than that he should cause one of these little ones to stumble. Be on your guard. If, a brother, if your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times a day, return to him your seven times saying, I repent and forgive him. You know, that millstone, is that you ever seen the big fat rock, right? It says if I <laughs> cause you to stumble, if my response to you and my whatever I do causes you to sin, causes you to to sin, it'd be better if I was thrown into the sea and have a millstone around my neck. Now, I think that's a figure of speech, but it kind of communicates <laughs> the seriousness of the way we should approach others and the seriousness of which we should help each other and not try and you know, make the flames worse, but be gentle. And then, um, of course, Galatians 6.1 says, if, if a man is found with a fault, you which are spiritual, restore him in the spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. You know, that we, we have a gentle spirit and we want to reach out. We're peacemakers. We're not, we're not throwing flu, fuel on the fire. We're there to pursue peace. Uh, back to Proverbs. Uh, I'll just read a couple of these. Proverbs uh, 5. Proverbs 5. I mean Proverbs 15, not Proverbs 5. Proverbs 15. Proverbs 15, verse 18. Look at this. It says, A hot-tempered man stirs up strife. But slow to anger calms a dispute. You see that? Don't get angry. If you're slow to anger, you can calm a dispute. Proverbs 16, verse 32. It says, he who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he who rules a spirit than he who captures a city. Wow. It's better than the person who captures a city if you are slow to anger, someone who doesn't get angry. Um, and there's more on that. I've given you the verses. Another thing, be careful what you say. What, do you, what comes out of your mouth? Don't just spew everything out that comes to your head because you know what? Sometimes things that come to my head really shouldn't be coming out of my mouth. You ever notice that? So, be willing to hold it and think and say to yourself, do I really want to speak this out? Do I really want to tweet this? Do I really want to put this out on a Facebook post? Do I want to say this? Maybe it's not the best thing to say everything that's in your brain, right? Be careful with what you say. Speak words that edify and build up. Proverbs 15, verse 2. 
it says, the tongue of the wise makes knowledge acceptable, but the mouth of fuel, fools spouts folly. <laughs> Don't be a fool with your mouth. 17, verse, 20, uh, verse 27. He who restrains his words, he, you restrain your words, you want to say something. Restrain, restrain, restrain your words, has knowledge, and he that has a cool spirit, that's, I want to have a cool spirit, right? That's what, we want to be cool. Cool, man. We're cool. Have a cool spirit is a man of understanding. Verse 28, even a fool, when he keeps silent, is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he is considered prudent. I think about this. I, I, maybe you guys have the same friends that I do. Like I, One thing I love about Facebook is uh, I'm able to reach out. Uh, like For me, it's been a, a way for me to connect with some of my high school friends that you know, I was with 40 years ago, which is kind of cool. Um, but you also see the good, the bad, and the ugly in that, right? And I tell you, I don't know about you, but I got friends that are on the far right, and I got friends that are on the far left, right? And I know some of these friends, in, the, in high school, they were real close. And now they're like, and this one goes, and I'm in the middle going, whoa. So you know what I did? I do this a lot is I don't write on the Facebook posts. I'll private message one of the people and I say, I see you're having some difficulty. Talk to me. Tell me about it. And then we get in a dialogue back and forth. And I just listen. I just let them tell me what's going on with them and this person. And then I Facebook the other person in a private message say, so what's, go, so what's happened to you with, you guys were real close. Well, well she, well, oh yeah, well, tell me about it. And then I write back to him and, I, and, and in both cases I say, you know, I think, there's a, I think there's a middle road for you guys. And I love you both. And that's really all I said, right? And now they'll write back to me and say, John, you're such a sage. You're a guru. I'm like, I didn't say anything. I just listened. And now I'm, you know, I'm going to go home. I'm hoping to spend time with each of them. And, and my goal, because I'm at peace with them, is that I'm going to have a chance to preach the gospel of the kingdom. Don't you see? I got an opportunity that is opened because I'm endeavoring to be a peacemaker, to have a dialogue with people so I can preach the gospel, so they can have eternal life. Right? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Let's be the children of God in this world. Be the peacemaker. Be the one that doesn't get caught into the divisions and the schisms and can listen. And just sometimes, sometimes a person just needs to talk. They just need to have the freedom to be able to tell you what's going on in their life. So um, I, I wrote some of these other verses. You know these verses, Ephesians 4, 31, right? Be ye kind, tenderhearted, you know, no anger, clamor, wrath but be kind, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. These, these are the verses we taught our children. And I think some adults need to be taught these verses, right? Be kind and tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Don't walk with anger and clamor and all that. Um, Matthew, Matthew 7. This is another big one, Matthew 7. Don't judge. Don't judge. You know, you, you look a certain way, and people, you already got a judgment. Oh, I, know what, I know what you're thinking. No, you don't. I don't know where you're coming from. I don't know what has been in your life. I don't know all the things that make up you. 
But we just, people get so quick to judge. Don't judge. Don't judge. Matthew 7, again, Jesus' words on the Sermon on the Mount, verse 1, do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you again. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but you don't notice that a log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye. You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. I love this. It's like, you know, you see this person, oh, look what you, I see what you're doing, right? And then you start judging, and what Jesus is saying is, the minute you start doing that, okay, you, got, you see a toothpick in his eye. You got a log in your eye, right? Take the log out of your eye. Don't judge. Listen. That's eh, just such a great truth. Romans 12. Finally, overcome evil with good. Be good. Reach out with a heart of mercy and compassion and do good to all people. Be good. Romans 12. Romans 12, verse 18. We'll read this verse again and then go on here. Romans 12, 18. If, it, if possible, so far as depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for his written vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, and sometimes we feel as though someone is an enemy with us or we are an enemy with someone else. If, if that is true, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him drink, for in so doing you will heap burning coals on his head. That means you'll warm him. Do not overcome by evil. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And finally, the close, James chapter 3. Hebrews, James chapter 3. James chapter 3. Great section here in James. James 3, verse 13. Who among you, and this I ask the question to all of us here, all everybody watching online, who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior, his deeds, in the gentleness of, of wisdom. But if you have bitter, jealousy, self ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but that is earthly, that is natural, that is demonic. For where jealousy and self-ambition exists, there is disorder in every evil thing. But this is the wisdom we are to have. The wisdom from above is first pure. Then what? Peaceable. It's peaceable. It's gentle. It's reasonable. It's full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in what? Peace by those who make peace. So I encourage us as the disciples of Jesus Christ, let the peacemakers rise up let the peacemakers take their stand 
in this world. Walk in the path of the Prince of Peace, the peacemaker, Jesus Christ. Walk in his path. Don't walk the path of the world, but walk in the path of Jesus Christ. Let your light shine and be a peacemaker that the world can see the children of God in times like these. Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. God, thank you for these words from our Lord Jesus. And God, that we come to you, help us keep our minds on you, that you would put within us perfect peace. God, right now, if we have anyone in our minds or our hearts that, that we know there may be some animosity, that there may be some bitterness, anger, um, God, help us. Show us, give us wisdom. How can we reach to those people and make peace? If we have a situation within families or loving friends, that we see that there is a division and schism, God, show us. Give us wisdom. I don't want to know who's right and wrong. I want to know how do I reconcile? How do I make peace? God, give us this, that we can have this gentleness of spirit and be peacemakers in an ungodly world. Thank you for this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.